This video is on nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. Now, your kidneys help you filter stuff, so let's draw it out. Here's your Bowman's capsule, your PCT, and it gets fed by your glomerulus, right? It gets fed by your glomerulus. And plasma and fluid and electrolytes and all that stuff goes through and gets filtered and your kidneys do its magic. Well, there are some things that don't actually go through. There are some things that we keep that are too valuable to go through. Things like proteins. We like proteins. <laughs> things like blood, like red blood cells. We don't want that to go through. We don't usually pee out protein. We don't usually pee out blood. But what happens if your glomerulus is damaged or your Bowman's capsule is damaged and it can no longer hold protein, hold red blood cells back. This will be the topic of our video today. Nephrotic and nephritic syndromes. Nephrotic and nephritic disorders. Okay, so let's just blow this up and magnify it. We have your glomerulus. which is basically a capillary, and then we have your Bowman's capsule. And there are many, many things that stop proteins, stop red blood cells from leaving. If we start at our innermost layer, our endothelium, we have a fenestrated endothelium. All capillaries have a fenestrated epithelium, and this acts as kind of a size barrier, size barrier. Proteins and red blood cells are too large to get through those little gaps. Yeah. So we're fenestrated epithelium. And then we have this thick basement membrane that again stops things from getting through. And if you wanna break it up into its three different layers, you can. The one closest to us, the most internal, we call the lamina rara interna. The one in the middle we call the lamina densa. And then the one, the most external one, we call the lamina externa. So that's, that's your glomerulus. How about your Bowman's capsule? Your Bowman's capsule also contributes. It has something called the podocytes. These large cells, large epithelium cells called the podocytes. Podocytes. And these have slits in them that again act as a size barrier. And they also have these negatively charged things called heparan, not heparin, heparan sulfate. So right, negatively charged. And the negatively charged heparan sulfate helps push back proteins. All right, so it acts as a charge barrier, all right, charge barrier. And not only that, the reason they're called podocytes is because they are cells that look like feet. They have these little foot processes. These little foot processes that attach onto your glomerulus and again, stops protein, stops red blood cells from getting through. That's a lot of uh, defenses, right? And so in normal kidneys, you don't get protein in your urine, you don't get red blood cells in your urine. We keep that in our body. It's nice and safe. However, if you have any sort of damage to the system, if you have damage to the system, then proteins can leak out, red blood cells can leak out, and that causes nephrotic nephritic syndrome. All right. When you damage this, then these leak out. And they're not exclusive. You don't only get protein leaking out. You don't only get red blood cells leaking out. That wouldn't make sense, right? You get a little bit of both. You get a little bit of both. But we try and classify, try and kind of categorize it just to simplify some things. When the majority of the thing that leaks out is protein, we call that nephrotic syndrome. And that's usually more than 3.5 grams of protein. And when you leak all that protein out, then your urine gets a little bit frothy. So it looks kind of frothy. But what happens in your body? Well, your body will freak out. It's like, I'm losing a lot of protein. I'm losing a lot of protein. When you lose this protein, when you lose the protein in your blood, when you lose that protein in your blood, then you lose oncotic pressure. You lose oncotic pressure and fluid will leak out into your body and you get edema. And your body freaks out. 
and says, I'll try and make some protein, try and pump some more protein in our blood, try and keep that oncotic pressure. So your liver tries to pump out more protein and you get hyperlipidemia. You try and put some more things into your blood vessels to try and keep that oncotic pressure. And so some things you'll see in nephrotic syndrome is fatty cast, fatty cast. You'll see a lot of fat in your kidneys. You, you'll not only lose some important proteins that you might lose is antithrombin-3. If you've done heme and onc, do you know antithrombin-3 is very important for keeping, for our coagulation cascade. And if you lose this, then you get hypercoagulable. I've seen questions where they'll talk about a patient who has nephrotic syndrome and then develops a DVT or a pulmonary embolus, some sort of thrombosis, and they might ask what happened. They lost antithrombin-3. Another very important protein you can lose is immunoglobulins. <laughs> immunoglobulins, that's not good. Those are super important for fighting infections. So that predisposes you to infections. Again, another question I've got, patient has nephrotic syndrome, starts getting more and more sick. Why? They're losing immunoglobulins, okay? So a lot of things you can lose, and that is all categorized by nephrotic syndrome, over 3.5 grams of protein. Now, if the majority of what you're losing is red blood cells, then we call that nephritic. Again, does that mean only red blood cells? You're not losing any protein? No, of course not. I mean, if you damage the system, you're gonna lose a little bit of both. But if it's mainly red blood cells, if you're less than 3.5 grams of protein, then you say, okay, it's nephritic. And when you lose those red blood cells, you'll pee that out and your urine will be darker. Sometimes they call it Coca-Cola urine. They're trying to get away with these kind of buzz terms, but if they say kind of amber, kind of darkest urine, you're thinking of nephritic syndrome, okay? And when you lose that red blood cell, when you lose blood volume, then your body freaks out and tries to get more blood volume. How does it do that? What's the system, the pathway? It's the RAS pathway, the RAS. And you'll reobtain salt, reobtain fluid, and you get hypertension. So hypertension is commonly seen in nephritic syndrome. So you have nephrotic, you have nephritic. Let's talk about nephrotic first. Let's talk about nephrotic first. So clear the board, right nephrotic. Nephrotic again is over 3.5 grams of protein and it causes all those things, edema, hypercoax state, infections, all that stuff. The first nephrotic disorder we're gonna talk about is minimal change disease, minimal change disease. This happens in kids, that's the easiest giveaway easiest giveaway, I'll put a star next to it, and you lose some protein, usually just a little bit of albumin, albumin. And because you're losing only one type of protein selectively, we call this selective proteinuria. And it's associated with things like infection, things like after post-immunization. One of the big ones, however, is Hodgkin's. What Hodgkin's and all and infections and post-immunization uh, share in common is that your cells release cytokines. Yeah, release cytokines. And that can damage your kidneys, destroy that kind of barrier, and you lose some albumin. Generally benign, generally they self-resolve. If they don't, you can give some corticosteroids, kind of dampen that cytokine release, kind of tell them, you know, <laughs> simmer down a little bit. So we can give corticoids, what will you see on imaging? Why do we think we call it minimal change disease? Because the damage is so kind of minute that the only thing you'll really see is when you look on electron microscope, those potos, those podocytes are a little bit flattened. So we said that your Bowman's capsule had those giant podocytes, right? Those cells. Well, they'll look a little bit flattened. All right. That's the only thing you see, is minimal change. That's why I call it minimal change disease. Our second nephrotic disorder is gonna be focal segmental. And this is seen more in the black and the Hispanic population. And it's associated with 
things like sickle cell, shouldn't surprise you. Also associated with things like HIV and heroin. And the reason, the reason they call it focal segmental is because when you look at the kidneys, if you look at the glomerulus, you'll have this focal area of destruction. You have that focal area of just mass carnage. So they call it focal segmental. A clever way I, I've seen it asked is they'll talk about some of a AIDS defining lesion and then develops nephrotic syndrome, you know, frothy urine, edema, all that stuff, puffy face. And then they might ask, what do you expect to see on biopsy? Focal segmental destruction, sclerosis, okay? So it's not too bad. A third type is called membranous glomerular nephritis. And this is more seen in the white population. And some rare, a rare cause of it is due to antibodies against phospholipase A2 receptors. These are a portion of your podocytes. And if you have antibodies against your podocytes and destroy your podocytes and you destroy that barrier and you lose protein. All right, that's a rare cause. More common causes are, again, due to cells acting wonky, cells releasing too much cytokines, cells destroying and creating these immune complexes and depositing and destroying your kidneys. So more common causes will be things like infections, hep, B, C, cancer we said, release of cytokines. You can have lupus, that's an autoimmune destruction and said use or uh, bad reaction to NSAIDs and that can cause destruction of your glomerulus, right? Destroy that kind of barrier. Now, why do they call it membranous glomerular nephritis? Because, because immunoglobulins, complements, immune complexes can all deposit under your membrane, deposit under your membrane and thicken your membrane. So we call it membranous glomerular nephritis. Done with that. Our fourth one is gonna be amyloidosis. Amyloid, misfolded protein, can deposit in your kidneys, damage your kidneys. Uh, what is this important to know about amyloidosis? How do we know something is amyloid? We have a special stain, we call that Congo red. I just love that name, Congo red. Always think of Congo River when you think amyloid. Those two always stick together. Always stick together. And our last one, our last nephrotic disorder is diabetic nephropathy. How does diabetes, high blood sugar, affect your kidneys? Well, let's draw it back out. Here's your glomerulus. Sugar by nature damages your barriers. And if that's not bad enough, sugar also damages your blood vessels, especially your efferent and causes sclerosis. And so this efferent is now sclerosed and tightened. What happens? What happens to your GFR if your efferent is constricted? Doesn't that increase GFR? And now you have more sugar. Now you have more sugar damaging your kidneys. And that's why Diabetic nephropathy is so common and so dangerous because it's like a bad cycle. It just goes on and on and on. Worse and worse, it gets worse and worse. All right, and that's also why ACE inhibitors help in diabetic nephropathy. Because ACE inhibitors, remember, dilate your efferent, reduce GFR, kind of reduce that strength, reduce that pressure. All right, so that's why ACE inhibitors help. So diabetic nephropathy, I'll write, what do I want to write? Highland arterial sclerosis. Sclerosis of your efferent arterial, right? And that causes damage. One of the first things you'll lose, kind of like in min minimal change, you're gonna lose albumin. And you can detect the early signs of di diabetic nephropathy by looking at albumin especially micro albuminuria. All right, 
So if you can catch it early, you can kind of pick it up. And you can catch it early by looking for the micro levels. All right, so microalbuminuria is the all right, first test. What do you see on imaging? You're gonna see big amounts of that arterial sclerosis. And it shows up as pink blobs. It's not the same as focal segmental. Focal is focal, it's the one spot, but it's just chaos, it's destruction all over the place. However, here in diabetic nephropathy is nice and confined. You have these nice, tiny pink blobs. All right, fancy name for these pink blobs is Kimmelstein Wilson. All right, that seems like a lot of information, I know, but it's not that bad. They're completely different. They're completely different on imaging. They're completely different on history. So let's just look at imaging. If you see pink blobs on imaging, diabetic nephropathy. If they so much as mention Congo red, amyloidosis. If it's a thick membrane, membranous. If it's focal destruction, focal segmental. If there's minimal change, it's minimal change disease. So it's different on imaging. It's different on history. If they give a history of a patient with diabetes, it's diabetic nephropathy. If they give a history of a white patient who might have cancer or might have hep, it's membranous. If they give a history of a patient who's black or Hispanic, who has sickle cell or HIV, then focal segmental. If it's a kid, minimal change. You don't even have to say anything more. If it's none of the above amyloid doses, okay? So it's different on history. It's different on imaging. How could you ever get them confused? All right, all you need to know is just a few facts of each should be golden, all right? Should be golden. So that is nephrotic syndrome, very easy. Let's talk about nephritic syndrome. Let's talk about nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome, we said, you still lose some protein, but you lose less than 3.5 and you're losing a lot of blood. That's kind of the name of the game, right? You're losing some blood. You get that Coca-Cola urine, you get that hypertension and it'll be in the question stem and you'll say, oh, it's nephritic. Now I have to figure out what type of nephritic. And lucky for you, there's only four types. And as you can imagine, they're all different on history. They're all different on imaging. So how could you ever get them confused? So there are only four types. Let's talk about them here. The first type is post-strep. What do you think <laughs> post-strep is? Why do you think it is called post-strep? It's after, it's after the patient has a strep infection. All right, and strep has a lot of kind of molecular mimicry. Your body freaks out, causes autoimmune destruction. That's why you get rheumatic fever. That's why you can get post-strep infection. You have all these immune complexes that can deposit. it. Some important thing to know is that if a patient has a strep infection, you give them antibiotics. Antibiotics can stop rheumatic fever. Stop rheumatic fever. But all those immune complexes have already deposited in your kidneys. They can't stop post-strep glomerular nephritis. So can't stop post-strep. Right. That's a common thing that they like to ask. What labs are you gonna order? Well, you have to confirm that the patient has strep infection. If you've done rheumatic fever, we've already talked about the labs. So just pause the video, tell me what labs you'd like to order to confirm the patient had a strep infection. If you give you a minute, all right. Those, are th those include things like anti-strep, the lysin O. Those include things like anti-DNA, ACE, B titers. And labs are commonly asked, and then they might ask you what does it look like imaging? You're gonna see all those immune complexes. So on immunofluorescence, you have all these little immune complexes. Or on electromicroscope, you have these sub-epithelial humps. Basically, those immune complexes have deposited and made these little humps. That's the first one. The second one is called rapidly progressive. sometimes called crescentic. And they call it crescentic is because you make this little crescent. You make this little crescent of proteins and macrophages. You could recognize this a mile away. Yeah, it's this beautiful crescent. That's why I call it crescentic. Why do I call it rapidly progressive? Because it's rapidly progressive. It's one of the most dangerous. And it can come from uh, other types of 
tubular disorder, for example, one type is called granular. Granular. And that can just come from a progression of post prep. So you have all these you have all these granular deposits. It can also come from other things. And so it can progress into rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. So I'll just write granular type is from previous kidney disorder. Another type is called linear. This is due to antibodies against the basement membrane of your kidneys. Basement membrane of kidneys. And, and your lungs. Kidneys and your lungs. Sometimes we call this good pastures. Can you think of how that might show up as? Well, nephritic will show up as red urine hypertension red blood cell cast in the urine. The lung part will show up as hemoptysis, shortness of breath. So if a patient comes in, let's see if we can synthesize this all into a step-like question. A patient comes in, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, bloody urine, what do they have? Or they might ask, what's the mechanism of which? Antibodies against the basement membranes. Or they might ask, what would, on biopsy of the kidneys, what would you see? A crescent. All right, so many ways they can jumble it, but if you can, Look at all the variables, make it into a step-like question. It kind of makes things easier to recognize on the question stand. So that is the linear type. One more type is called the negative type or posse immune. Posse immune. They call it the negative type because you don't have deposition of compounds. Negative type Rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis is caused by vasculitis. Vasculitis. So pause the video and tell me everything you know about vasculitis. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You'll be here all day. There's like a ton of vasculitis. Um, I'm not going to do that to you. So there's only three vasculitis that can cause this rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. You have, oh man, uh, I wish they had shorter names, but they don't. You have granuloma ptosis with polyangitis. Tell me what you know about this one, all right? We only have three of them, so I'm gonna give you a break. All you have to do is tell me what you know about these three. So tell me what you know about this one. At least tell me what you know for lab findings. This is C oncopositive, right? You have microscopic polyangitis, and that is Pianca positive. And then you have eosinophilic granulomatosis, which is also Pianca positive. How can you tell these two Pianca positive things apart? How can you tell them apart? Pause the video, tell me how you can tell them apart. Well, they call it eosinophilic for a reason. It's associated with Asthma, and you'll see eosinophils in the blood. Okay, so let's see if we can synthesize all these variables into a step-like question. The patient comes in with complaining of asthma and bloody urine. You you biopsy the kidney, and in the glomerulus you see this crescentic sign. What other lab findings are you expecting, Bianca? Yeah, so that's one way they can do it. There are many other ways. And as long as you can, or as long as you're able to kind of manipulate the question, you make things very easy. So we're all done with rapidly progressive. Let's move on. Third type of nephritic syndrome is IgA nephropathy. This can come after an infection. You say, wait, we well, already have one that comes after an infection. What makes it different? This comes days after an infection. Post strep usually comes weeks. So this comes days after an infection and it has an intermittent course. It can come and go, come and go, come and go. That's something unique. So it can remit. But probably the most important, the most glaringly obvious thing is that you'll have deposits, you'll have deposits that are made of IgA. IgA. Why do you think they call it IgA nephropathy? If they're going to call it IgA nephropathy, those deposits better be IgA. So I've seen questions that say 
the positives are made of IgA. I mean, do you want to spell it out for you? Is IgA nephropathy. Our last one is going to be Alport syndrome. Alport syndrome. This is a defect in type 4 collagen. Type 4 collagen. And this type 4 collagen is going to be seen in the basement membrane of your lamellulus. Basement membrane, as well as your ears and your eyes. And if you have a defect in it, then you have a thin basement membrane. You have a thin barrier. That's why you get the nephritic problems. If you have a thin basement membrane in your ears, you're going to have things like deafness. Thin membrane in your eyes, you're going to have difficulty seeing. So patients born, patients born, hasn't had an infection, hasn't had all this crap. A patient just born and then has nephritic syndrome. You know, there's some sort of like hereditary defect. So, all right, young patient, young patient with nephritic, they can't hear, they can't see. I mean, it's a dead giveaway. Easy, easy peasy. Okay. That is it for nephritic. Again, again, completely different on history, completely different on imaging. So how could you ever get them confused? All right. That is nephritic. That is nephritic. And now I'm going to confuse you a little bit. <laughs> right after I said you should never get them confused, now I'm going to try and confuse you a little bit. I got to make it hard for you. Otherwise... You know, I'm not doing my job. Can't be too easy. There are two disorders that can cause both. We call them mixed disorders. Mix. But lucky for us, the imaging is a little bit different so you can pick it up right away. The first mixed disorder is called diffuse proliferative. And this is also associated with lupus. Can you tell me what we talked about that was already associated with lupus? That would be membranous, right? So what's the difference? Here, like I said, the imaging gives it away. You get these little loops in your glomerulus. Loops. That's it. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I want to talk about. The second one and the last one, the thing that will close out this video, you're probably very thankful for that, is going to be membranoproliferative. You have type 1, which is associated with hep B, a little bit more than hep C. Again, what did we talk about was associated with hep B? That'd be membranous again, it rears its ugly head. But we said the imaging is unique. For type 1, you have your basement membrane, but you also get these deposits in your basement membrane, and it kind of splits the basement membrane. So you have the mem basement membrane that kind of splits. So, all right, split basement membrane. A great picture will be in my notes. So make sure you know that. Well, that's type one. Type two. Has the thickest membrane you will ever see in your freaking life. Again, another great picture will be in my notes, but it has a huge thick membrane. Thick membrane. And the thing they like to ask more than anything is that it is associated with antibodies against C3 convertase. And these antibodies don't destroy it, but it actually stabilizes it. It's actually a friend of it. It stabilizes it. We call this, we call this stabilizing friend C3 nephritic factor. What a great name. C3 nephritic factor. And it stabilizes C3. What does C3 do? Well, C3 activates your complements. And if you stabilize it, then you just activate more and more and more and more complements. And all those complements will deposit and make your membrane so thick it's unbelievable. It causes a thick membrane. Labs, low C3. Why is it low? Because they've all deposited in your kidneys. <laughs> so you get low C3. But always know C3 nephritic factor. That does it for nephritic, nephrotic. Hopefully you're able to discern all the different types, again, by imaging, by history. If you can do that, you're in good shape. Thanks for watching, see you next time.